the, these things and you know some of these things i, I started you know to in, integrating into my own my own swing but so anyway as far as that goes you know my my tour career was uh you know i I played okay. I was kind of a, you know, I was make a guy that just made a lot of cuts and wasn't really winning tournaments much, but I was occasionally would get close or, you know, maybe on Saturday I'd, you know, get be in the top 10 or something. But I, I mean, I wasn't, I was never out dominating or you know, anything like that. And uh, so a big moment for me was uh, I was playing in the Australian Open at Royal Melbourne. I think this was 1987, my first year. So I, I got a, a exemption onto the Australian tour because I played well enough in Canada to go down there and play the tour there. So, you know, it's pretty fun. But I, I at that Australian Open, um, I w I'm, I'm hitting balls, uh, you know, one of the rounds between uh, Greg Norman and Sandy Lyle. Sandy Lyle just, you know, won the Masters, I think, or the British Open. You know, he's kind of, a, you know, one of the top players in the world at the time. Yeah. Definitely. And I, I remember the sound of the golf ball and I'm hitting balls in between them. And it was like in stereo. Right. And I'm just right. hearing impression, this deep sound that was so different than what I was doing. I was still using a, a swingers release, kind of a mm. golf machine, what they would call the dual horizontal hinge roll or whatever. And uh, took an incredible amount of practice, you know, to time that because there was so much club face closure from open to just closing rapidly through the shot. It was all extremely timing based, but it did work well as long as the acceleration was steady and even. That was the key. But to accelerate steady and even, my body didn't always want to do that, especially sure. if I got off the plane and I just flew for 14 hours or something like that and you know your body's just a mess when you get off the plane or you're in a car you know we were driving the Canadian tour because you know we couldn't afford to fly then yeah. so you know but I remember the drive from Winnipeg to Windsor was like you know 18 hours or something you know it was Oof. just a you know, and you just get out and you're back I mean, I'm in my 20s but I'm still like just wow this hurts <laughs> you know, this, right you know, and it was a lot of stretching and yoga and stuff and all these things that I was doing to, to try and just get, it would take me a couple days to get my body back flexible enough to where I could get that steady, even acceleration. But I, I remembered what these guys were doing. The sound was completely different than what I was doing. And, and I had this aha moment and it was kind of like, you know what, I'm not really going to be able to play against these guys, you know, properly unless I start doing what they were doing, you know, and I knew that it, it was different. <clears throat> so while I had this video camera, you know, I was using it a lot. One of my little tricks would be that I would be filming myself and then I would leave the camera on or I'd put a little piece of tape over the red light so nobody would know it was on. And right. I would walk to my bag and maybe talk to another pro for a few minutes while it was filming one of these other players. You know, <laughs> that's, pretty that's pretty clever. That's pretty clever, Jeff. And I'm probably going to get sued. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I would get all kinds of different players, and I'd, I'd study their swings, and I'd look. And I remember uh, one of the players that won, uh, uh, Rick Rick Todd. I'll say his name. He's a great player from Texas, uh, El Paso, and he he won back to back tournaments on the Canadian Tour, which is incredible. I mean, think about you got 144 guys, 143 guys you got to beat that week, right? Yeah. And at any given week in one of these tour events, somebody or multiple players is having the best week of their life, right? right. Some guy's putting lights out, he's getting all kinds of good breaks, all that. It's very hard to win a tournament and to beat, you know, if you're just kind of one of the average guys out there, you know. I mean, you know, you wait for your your time to come up but if you were if it was just random probability there's 144 guys and you're an average guy you might win one out of 144 events right right so yeah. let's say you're playing, you know you're playing 25 events a year so you might win one out of every five years or something yeah you know what i mean yeah so um which is about kind of right sort of i mean for the average you know your typical guy out there right sure um, so 
So when you're getting back to Rick Todd, so, you know, he wins back to back and I, and I videotaped his swing and he was holding shaft flex, you know, and, and it was really great. You know, he's swinging great. Now about five weeks later, he's missing cuts and, you know, he's not, he's just playing like, you know, normal player. <laughs> right? And I, I videotaped his swing and he was over accelerating and not holding shaft flex. Yeah. That's interesting. So that was another kind of an aha kind of moment too, where I started to notice that like, Hmm, you know, what's up here watching Greg Norman and the guy that impressed me the most in Australia was Peter senior, another huge influence on the, you know, the, the TV people would, you know, say, wow, this guy's a terrible swing, but he gets it done and blah, blah, blah. They didn't, you know, he wasn't really getting complimented much. You know, they, it was kind of this real slashing kind of, but I was always interested in explaining, like, why are these guys good? You know, when I'd see a guy with a terrible swing that go out and shoot 64, I never wanted to to uh, discount that, you know, or just sure. say, well, or just say, yeah, that's just, he's a weird anomaly, you know, or whatever. Right. I always wanted to understand how and why these guys were successful. I was more interested in them. You know, and some of my earlier teachers tended to want to not really acknowledge, you know, some of these golf swings that weren't, you know, technically correct in their eyes, you know. Yeah. But being out on the tour and being a test subject of the golfing machine, I couldn't deny the fact that these guys are just kicking my butt, right? right. So. I need to know why, you know, why is it going, why is that going on? So, so when I came back from uh, Australia, I think it was maybe the, I don't know if it was the first year, but I think it was maybe the second year. I think, I think it was, it might've been after the first year. No, no, it was after the second year down there. It's the second year down there. And then I, I just, I went to Greg McCann and I just said, you know, I'm, this isn't going to work. You know, I'm not going to get my game. I'm never going to be able to win out here, mm -hmm. you know? Um, because I didn't, you know, my putting was, you know, we all like to complain about our putting, right? But I was yeah. really pretty less than average, you know, not good around the club. Like you'd in you know, anyone around the courses back home, like in Fresno where I was living, oh, John's, you know, has a great short game or whatever. You have to have a pretty good short game to be a pro. Yeah, absolutely. But guys that could really roll that rock, you know, I felt like I was giving up two shots around, you know, like one on each nine. Yeah. And, and what is that difference? You know, that, that one guy that just, it, his putt just falls in and yours just lips out. I mean, it's such a tiny thing, but it's a very real thing. Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, oh, yeah. Just It could just be that one little putt where you just don't have the right intuition about the speed or, or just whatever. But I really felt like I was giving up <clears throat> two shots around. And – at the end of the week, you know, that's, that's eight shots. Now, yeah. if I got to take, if I got to take eight shots off every week that I played, then I would have been one of those top players, right? Sure. You know, I would have been, you know, a, a guy like, you know, whoever, you know, guys that were Colin Montgomery, you know, these people that were out there winning the tournaments and stuff. I mean, if I could take eight shots, if every time I shot, one under par for the four rounds, I, I say I'm at nine under par. Oh, I went from finishing 43rd to finishing second or third, right? Or winning or whatever. Yeah. So I knew that um, I was going to have to hit the ball better, you know, to win. So when I went back home, Greg and Ben uh, were swinging teachers, you know, golfing machine swinging teachers. They weren't really interested in teaching hitting. Maybe they did later. I, I don't know. But at that time, we're talking like 1987, right? Or 88 in there. <clears throat> and Bobby Clamp, it was, you know, had had his great success as a college player. Was, you know, I think he won on the tour. And so he was still kind of, you know, in the conversation, like this is the right way to do it, you know. And I just felt like it wasn't, you know. It wasn't for me. And I wanted that. So there wasn't anyone to teach it to me. No one was going to teach me how to hit. So I realized I was going to have to teach myself. But because I had the background of the golfing machine, I was already thinking outside the box. 
Mm -hmm. Having been exposed to Mo Norman, I was thinking outside the box. And being a 23-year-old that had the opportunity to hit balls, you know, between Greg Norman and Sandy Lyle was like, I'm thinking outside the box here. This is something different. So mm -hmm. basically, after studying and um, I, re I remembered uh, we would like getting a whole, you know, there's no YouTube back then, right? So if you want to see swings of Hogan or Gary Player and Palmer or Nicholas in his prime, it would be on videotape. Yeah. And it wasn't readily available. Like you couldn't go to the library or you couldn't, you know. Um, so there was kind of an underground um, tape trading and swapping, almost like baseball cards or something. In fact, I remember getting some great footage from your friend, Bobby Schaefer. Right? <laughs> yeah. And Shane had this, like, some of these videos of Hogan and stuff. And I think I might have traded him something. Hey, I got this and you got that. And, and um, you know, and then I remember that was the first time that I saw really good footage of Hogan, you know. And then it's like, oh, so he's doing the same thing that these guys were doing. Okay. Mm. Yeah. So I started really looking at that, <clears throat> you know, and Gary Player and George Knudsen and you know, all this stuff. And and then, you know, Mac O'Grady was, you know, at hot on the scene, you know, winning on the tour, which incredible that Mac O'Grady could win on the PGA Tour twice, I think, right? And yeah. And the guy could not putt at all. I mean, he was worse than me by a lot. I mean, to so to be able to win on just ball striking, I mean, that's really incredible. I mean, that, yeah. that's really incredible that he was able to do that because he's a horrendously poor putt. He'd be the first to admit it. Right? I mean, just yeah. You know. So um, and then I, you know, I had some video of Mac too, and I was looking at that. Oh, he's holding shaft flex, and he's got that sound on the ball, and he's a hitter. He's you know, so I'm a hitter, he's not the swinger. So, you know, and, and the whole Morad thing, it was like this kind of secret cult. And I remembered uh, Carlos Espinosa, a great Mexican player that was playing in the county. He had some secret, you know, writings of Mac or whatever, like, you know, the precursor to his upcoming book that he never released. And it, it was almost like he wasn't supposed to have it. And, and we'd be like sitting in a hotel room in Vancouver, like at late at night, like, you know, trying to read this cryptic stuff or whatever. <laughs> You know what this uh, this angle meant, and what you know, you know P six point five three, and the you know this arm needs to be at this degree, you know, and all this stuff. It was pretty crazy, but at the time, you know, we we're like, wow, this is really you know really serious stuff, you know. Yeah. So it was just kind of interesting. So that's kind of like my background, the curiosity of like the swing and that sort of thing. And then, so I went through this process, and I just basically tore my golf swing apart, started essentially not completely over but you know what i mean i really made some radical changes and it took me about eight months and that was um you know just 24 7 golf pretty much i mean i would just wake up early and go out running and get my body in shape and then you know go out hit you know two milk carton crates you know 250 golf balls in a crate and i'd you know hit two of them i'd hit like 500 balls and and then I'd go play 18 holes and then I'd work on my short game and then I'd go hit another, hit more balls. And, you know, it was just that kind of intense, almost like Olympic type training type, type of thing. And then I just looked at these things and I just kind of created what I thought would be the right way to do things. And uh, all of a sudden, I noticed that I'm starting to hit the ball a lot better than I did. Oh, wow. And now I have a swing the key here was I had a swing that could travel, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, I could drive for eight hours and get out of the car and just tee it up and get it in the fairway, you know? It was like, I was confident I could, you know, knock it out there. And so I had this accelerating swing, a shorter backswing, uh, more pivot rotation, holding shaft flex, all this stuff. And, uh, and in 1991, you know, for me, it came to fruition and, uh, I was able to win uh, on the Canadian Tour, where I shot 1,700 par and uh, uh, beat Mo Norman's tournament record there, and beat this guy named Bradley Hughes coming down the stretch. You know who was I knew mm. who he was. He was a great player. And, yeah. Uh, of course, he's a much better player than I ever was. But um, you know that one week when I'm playing really well, and he's you know he's playing well, obviously too. But it was it was exciting to feel 
confident um, about my swing and that it was going to hold up on Sunday. And I only missed uh, four greens in four days, you know, which is pretty good. That's that's unbelievable. And I was never I was never under thirty putts, you know, and mm. in any of the rounds. So it was really a ball striking, you know, that, that did it. The putting I probably probably putted a little better than I normally did, but it was still, you know, it was it was hitting the ball well, and um, it kind of made me realize that what I was working on was in fact a better method, at least for me, it certainly was, <clears throat> and I. Um, so I got pretty sold on the, the hitting methodology. And then, you know, so I continued to do that. But this was, uh, you know, so I played seven seven years. And um, after that, I, I just decided to retire from the tour because I really still didn't putt good enough, you know. And I saw the, my future. I was just going to be one of those 40-something guys still chasing the sunsets, thinking, you know, you know. You know, you just see it. I mean, I, I remember going to PJ Tour School finals one year in Houston. I was playing with like Forrest Fesler, the guy, you know, he was a guy who, I think he's the guy that wore shorts in the US Open and, you know, it was a big, he got banned, you know, I don't know. Just, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, but, you know, he, I just remember him being a guy like here he is. He was in his 40s then and mid 40s, he's still trying to get back on the tour and stuff. And, um, you know, I would kind of see these guys and, I just kind of didn't want to be one of those guys. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to either really make it and be kind of a star or, you know, a guy that's really, you know, maybe would be top 50 in the world, you know, something like that. And I just don't think that I had that, you know, to be that good. And the putting was holding me back. And I know it sounds, you know, everybody says they don't putt, you know, but, you know, it is kind of, it was true. You know, I just um, didn't putt that well. So anyway, I, I just retired and I, I had exemptions, you know, I didn't retire because I couldn't have anywhere to play. I, I, I was still exempt in Canada and Australia and stuff like that, but I, um, I just burned out on all the traveling. I was on the road eight months of the year and I did that for seven years. I mean, it's a long time, you know, to yeah. live that living out of a suitcase you know, eight months of the year. So I just uh, decided to be like a regular person, you know, I mean, be able to stay home, have